Welcome. Thank you for joining us to explore the artistic legacy of Doc's Thrash, an influential artist and activist who lived and worked in Philadelphia from the late 1920s until his death in 1965. Over the course of this hour, we will hear from Ron Rumford of Dolan Maxwell Gallery in Philadelphia, followed by historic preservationist Maya Thomas, founder of the Docs Thrash House Project. She will speak about this group's efforts to save Thrash's historic home located in the Sharswood District, an important center of African American culture in the mid 20th century, and their Black Futures campaign to raise funds for the project. Thomas's project colleagues, Dana Rice and Chris Mulford, who are architects, will join in the general discussion amongst all panelists after the presentations. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge Manhattan Graphic Center's supporters, which include the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, the Sherman Foundation, and the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation. We have received additional support for our online programs, including tonight's event, from the Niska Electronic Media Film in partnership with Wave Meat Farm Media Arts Assistance Fund with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Thank you also to all the other foundations and individual donors who support MGC. A few notes about tonight's event. We have disabled the chat function for the webinar to allow you full enjoyment of the images and voices you will hear. Please type any questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. We will answer selected questions as they arise, and others will be reserved for the discussion to follow the presentations. Our first speaker tonight will be Ron Rumford, director of Dolan Maxwell in Philadelphia. Dolan Maxwell has long represented Thrash's work and has co-organized exhibitions of his work for the High Museum of Art, Asheville Art Museum, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, Palmer Museum of Art, Syracuse University Art Museum, and the Hyde Collection. They are currently co-organizing a 2021 exhibition with the African American Museum in Philadelphia that will be on view in the fall of next year. And now please welcome Ron Rumford. to unmute myself there. Hello, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, nice to be a part of this uh, exciting effort to um, bring forth, I, I always say Doc's Thrash is too little known. And um, I think uh, the efforts to save his historic house here in Philadelphia and uh, create community around uh, where he lived and worked um, can only be a good thing and, and um, again, make people know him better. Uh, Thrash was born in uh, Griffin, Georgia, uh, south of Atlanta. He was the son of sharecroppers. He is born in 1893, we believe. Uh, there's some, some cloudiness around that date. Uh, but we do know that he left Georgia um, ahead of the Great Migration uh, in about 1908. He's 15. Uh, he leaves and goes to Chicago. Uh, to find work, and uh, he, indicate that he indicated that he'd always wanted to be an artist, and so um, was able to find a, a welcome uh, place at the Art Institute of Chicago, the, the famed um, uh, art school in Chicago. Um, and over four years, he's able to uh, study there, and he studies commercial art and painting and drawing. Um, his studies are interrupted when he uh, serves in uh, the U.S. Army. He was one of the, the fabled uh, Buffalo soldiers, and uh, he serves in Paris, or sorry, in France, uh, at the front. Um, he has the horrific experience of, of being gassed uh, in the last hours uh, of that war, um, and returns home after spending some time in, in France. Uh, and returns to the Art Institute, uh, where he's able to study with um, African American painters who, who are mentors, William E. Scott and William Harper. 
uh, after uh, he finishes school there, a few years later, he leaves Chicago and he travels. Um, he, uh, on his way to Chicago, he worked um, in vaudeville and, and uh, he had a, a, a sort of a joke telling and, and dance uh, routine that he did. Um, so when he left um, uh, the Art Institute, he went on, goes on the road and he's able to uh, uh, take up that kind of work again. He travels to Boston. He travels to uh, Connecticut for a year. He has a brother in, in Boston, I should say. Um, and he stops in New York and then stops in Philadelphia um, in the late 1920s. And there he settles and ends up staying there for the rest of his life. Um, I believe that in Philadelphia, he's able to uh, become an artist again in that he can take classes in printmaking at what's known as the uh, Graphic Sketch Club. And the Graphic Sketch Club is a, a community-based uh, arts education uh, institution. It, it continues today and is known as the Fleischer Art Memorial. And um, that's where I took printmaking classes myself uh, a long time ago, but it continues and it's very important. Um, and, and at uh, the Graphic Sketch Club, he's able to work with um, an artist named Earl Horder. And Earl Horder uh, is his own fascinating story um, in that he was a very successful commercial artist. He uh, amasses a fortune and a, a fabulous collection of modern art. And then he loses it all in the depression and uh, he goes back to printmaking. And he uh, creates a new method for making aquatints. And he's very successful with this and wins prizes uh, for his aquatints. And uh, Doc's Thrash, and we know uh, another um, fine African-American artist named Alan Freelon are working very closely at the Graphic Sketch Club with Earl Horder. And uh, Thrash makes some beautiful um, aquatints at this time and etchings. Uh, we know that he admires uh, Rembrandt, he admires Whistler and, and Goya, and uh, Horder's um, method for, for finding the, for, for making these very planar um, tones of, lit, of, of aquatint um, uh, develop out of his own admiration for, for Goya's work. Um, and so I believe his ability to do this sets him up for his own discovery some five years later um, when he works for the WPA workshop in Philadelphia. Uh, he, he does begin showing um, in the 30s. He shows at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, and uh, by 1936, 1937, uh, he finds employment at the WPA print, Fine Print Workshop. Um, I believe there are only two uh, fine print workshops as part of the WPA. One was in New York and the other in Philadelphia. Uh, the Philadelphia workshop is distinguished in that uh, they hired some four or five uh, African-American artists, um, knowing that the African-Americans were not always welcome um, for these opportunities. Um, and at this point, I think um, he's got some experience of, of showing his work and, and making work, um, but I think, I think he finds his, his home or he, he finds his, his place in making art in printmaking. And uh, another beautiful aquatin on the screen called Bronze Boy, um, made also in the, the fine art workshop, uh, print workshop of the WPA. Um, the WPA is uh, contentious. People don't like the idea that the government is paying artists to make art. Um, and so uh, as he's diligently working, um, he, he has an issue of, of, of affording materials. Uh, copper is very expensive. Um, and he has the idea that maybe he could recycle copper. Um, by grinding the plates with carborundum grit. And, and carborundum particles are already in the, the print workshop because 
that is the method by which uh, lithographic stones are resurfaced so that may, they may be reused. Uh, Thrash has an idea that maybe uh, if he grinds the plate, he'll find another use. Uh, so he does, and he gets this very deep, uneven texture all over the copper plate. Um, and if you uh, just print it after uh, grinding the plate, you would end up with uh, a, a very deep kind of velvety black. And from there, Thrash realizes that he can um, burnish out the texture, bur burnished out the, the pits that are made by the grit. Uh, and in that way, pulling light out of dark. So here on screen is a, a, a carborizer mezzotint called uh, Cabin Days. Um, and it's part of a group of things that he did uh, that are about recalling um, or uh, his life in the South. His, his family lived in a former slave's cabin. Um, so I think this is very much the reality of, of his life. And, and he makes oh, maybe 10 or 20 uh, images of uh, these kind of ramshackle cabins uh, from his youth and, and I believe where his family continued to live uh, after he left in, in Griffin, Georgia. Um, so uh, in, in doing this, uh, the, uh, the fine art print workshop of the WPA, um, their job they feel they express is, is to create, um, in addition to opportunities for artists, um, uh, to, to produce excellent, to, to produce works that are exciting and new. And so he, um, and credited it with two other artists, Michael Gallagher and Hugh Mezeboff. Uh, there's great fanfare and the Carbro and the Mesotins are then shown. Um, and, and this kind of makes Thrash's name. He, he's, uh, he, he, he's allowed to, to be celebrated uh, because of this invention. Um, and he goes on to make a very wonderful body of work uh, on screen now is a print called Charlotte, um, and that is a carborundum mezzotint, uh, a portrait. Uh, portraits are something he does more than many artists uh, of, at this period. Um, he also does a lot of nudes, um, and later on we'll see some pictures of, of a lot of images of Philadelphia. Uh, this is another version of, of Charlotte. So um, I think he, we believe he, he kept going back to the plates and and altering them and reburnishing them. So we believe this is from the same plate. As you can see, a very, very different uh, image. Um, and I believe he's, he's changing the meaning uh, of what he's doing, um, as well as uh, reworking the plate and, and, and finding new um, nuance and ability uh, to do that from, from his own invention. Uh, he has a, a wonderful time in the, in the 1940s. He has uh, important solo exhibitions and um, uh, he shows in Philadelphia at the Art Alliance. He shows uh, at the Smithsonian later on in his career in the, in the 1950s. Um, he has a show at the, the Pyramid Club, an important um, social club for, uh, set up by, by black professional people. Um, and Thrash is part of their committees to, to have exhibitions, uh, and they invite artists from, from all over the country to show there. Um, and I, I feel his, his work is about his life. He, he's very much an observer um, and uh, has tremendous empathy for uh, what he sees and then also a great ability to, um, to, to execute what he wants or what, what, what he wants his work to be. Um, and uh, I think that uh, after um, uh, we'll, we'll come up to some images of, of Philadelphia houses. Uh, this is a carborunda mezzotint, uh, again, called uh, The Vendor. Um, so there are a number of street scenes which indicate to me that he, he, he enjoyed where he lived and, and and found meaning within um, his community and, and, and loved what, what that was about, being part of a city. Um, when the WPA is over, he, he struggles quite a bit. He finds work with the Sun Shipbuilding Company and um, 
that is in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania. The WPA was closed uh, and all the people working there were told to find work uh, to support the war and, or, or that there was work in support of the war. Um, but uh, Thrash uh, was turned away from the, the Navy Yard in Philadelphia and, and that was uh, really a, a horrible thing to, to do to a veteran. Uh, but uh, the government then contracted with, the Defense Department contracted with Sun Shipbuilding and uh, there was a dry dock there um, that was set up and, and staffed by um, all African Americans and they built something like 50 odd ships uh, for the, the, the war effort. Um, and uh, Thrash later on works for the, um, the Housing uh, Authority in Philadelphia, ironically enough, um, and uh, uh, continues to show his work at the, the Pyramid Club. Um, and, and his career tapers off late in life. Um, but we're, we're so fortunate to have what we have. And um, I believe without the WPA, I don't, I don't think we would know him. I don't think he would have created a, um, a substantial enough body of work uh, that was exhibited and celebrated at its time and, and here for us to uh, continue to celebrate and, and uh, enjoy. Thank you, Ron. That was really um, a helpful overview. I've learned a lot about um, Thrash's work and there's, um, we'll go over some resources where you can delve further into his artistic uh, career uh, at the end of the presentation. But now we will hear from Maya Thomas, who is the founder of the Docs Thrash House Project. Thomas is originally from Los Angeles, California, and is project manager with Mural Arts Philadelphia. She holds a master's degree in historic preservation from the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in history from Hampton University. She will speak more about the neighborhood in which Thrash worked and the effort to save his home. After her presentation, we will be joined by her colleagues, Dana Rice and Christopher Mulford, as well as Ron Rumford for an open discussion and Q&A. Thank you, Maya. I should unmute myself. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the um, for having us and to talk about this campaign and our and our work um, that we've been conducting for a little over four years. Um, I'm not sure where everybody is from, so I have lots of maps to show you and to kind of introduce you to the neighborhood that Doc Thrash. Um, lived in and lived for the rest of uh, and lived out the rest of his later life. Um, um, and looking at his house, where uh, we can't um, neglect looking at his neighborhood. Um, and he lived in the neighborhood that's currently called Charleswood um, in Philadelphia. And the current conditions in that neighborhood, um, if you notice, there are lots of red lines. Um, and those represent vacant lots. Um, and just the, the main avenue and thoroughfare, thoroughfares are Ridge Avenue and Cecil B. Moore and also Gerard um, Avenue. In the time of Doc's Thrash in 1925, when he lived in this neighborhood, this is what that neighborhood looked like. Um, completely different, less vacant lots, um, and also a thriving art center. Um, so this is Doc Thrash's house, this is Ridge. Um, Cecil B. Moore used to be called Columbia Avenue. Um, and then we had the Pearl Theater. And then we also had the Checker Club um, that supported the, uh, the Pearl Theater and the Pyramid Club. Um, the Pyramid, the Pearl Theater was actually a vaudeville theater where lots of legendary jazz musicians and artists of the time like Duke Ellington and John Coltrane would visit and, and come into the neighborhood and kind of relax and um, put on shows. Actress Pearl Bailey was discovered there. Um, her house is also in this neighborhood. Um, and then the Pyramid Club itself, um, which was actually also helped and founded by Doc Thrash and a lot of affluent African Americans was a place where it was safe to and enjoy culture, enjoy art, to relax. Um, there's pool tables there, there's art shows there. You can see Doc Thrash here um, talking about art um, to two club members. 
Um, so it was a really a nice um, time and full of art, the neighborhood was in 1925. Um, and so with our work um, and knowing the history of that neighborhood, um, it reestablishes a community arts center, um, which is now gone from the neighborhood. Um, so reclaiming that Doc Splash house is really, really important um, to the vitality of the neighborhood. Um, if we look at Sharswood today, um, we have Doc Splash's house here to kind of center, center you. Um, the PHA headquarters is here now. The Pyramid Club is here. Um, and we have the MLK Rec Center. Um, but surrounding this neighborhood, um, we have these other neighborhoods that are rapidly developing, um, already developed. So there is a severe development pr um, pressure coming into Sharswood with Brewery Town here, Fairmont here, Temple over here. Um, you have all these pressures coming from all sides. Um, and it's very, very important that folks in the neighborhood are, they, they know their history, they know what's there. Um, they, they're able to kind of reiterate and kind of voice their opinion about um, their neighborhood and what, what it used to be like. Um, so this is just further um, kind of highlighting the resources that are there for current residents um, and Doc Stars House being in the center of all of it uh, with luckily the, uh, the Cecil B. Moore Library, the branch of the Free Library in Philadelphia being right next to it. So that's a really, really excellent resource to kind of capitalize on when we're thinking about building out a neighborhood and kind of reestablishing the arts. This is um, the North Philly Peace Park, which is um, a garden for, that gives out free food. Um, this is the Stephen Klein Wellness Center that is a health and medical center. This is the Martin Luther King Recreation Center. There's a pool, there's a basketball court, and then Malcolm X's house is also historic is right over here in the corner. And so this is the house. This is where Doc Slash lived his life, um, was very, very influential in the community. Besides his artwork, he was very um, hands-on as far as making sure that he was training and influencing artists. Um, looked out from his window, there's so many um, art pieces that are right from this, this neighborhood itself that he created. Um, right from, you can look out from his window and see some of these places that he was talking about. Ron talks about the shipyard. So I, this is like one of my favorite pieces that he did with the ship fitters is called. Um, and then also his training of artists um, and the new generation of artists. Um, this is a, a, a book from the Pyramid Club where they used to sell advertisements from the inside. So he would do the covers and it would become a work of art. And so any advertisers that would create a revenue, a, a, create a revenue stream for the Pyramid Club. Um, very influential in the community himself, just by, um, besides just his art. Um, so this recovery of this African-American historic treasure will kind of solidify what's already there in the neighborhood um, and bring the arts back, but also kind of make the current residents uh, comfortable to stay and, and talk about their, their, their history. Um, and in this project, that's really, really our focus is to make sure that the, the current residents um, are able to stay in their homes um, and be comfortable there. Um, and also introduce anyone that's coming into the neighborhood, um, have all the historic resources from the past that are still there um, to uh, identify this neighborhood in its, in its character. Um, and so with this project, we've um, kind of gone through a long process and identified and kind of structured um, the way that we wanted to kind of roll out this campaign. Um, so over four years, we've come up with a de development partner, a programming partner. There's several possibilities with the programming partner um, and then us. Um, and the first step that we took is to partner with a, a very strong organization called the Community Futures Lab, which is an arts project in Philadelphia um, around 2017 to 2018. They were uh, collecting um, histories and memories of current residents during the time when the PHA was uh, developing and kind of tearing out the neighborhood with eminent domain. Um, so they took the time to kind of collect these histories, record them and save them, um, but also with the eye on the future um, to think about what, what's next for this neighborhood with the current residents before anyone else comes in and tells them what's next for their neighborhood. Um, so it was a very, um, Great opportunity to work with them um, during our, our first initial stages of coming into um, and working with this project. 
Um, and then also reestablishing this corridor for Ridge Avenue, the business corridor is very, very important, um, especially for neighborhoods. Um, so Fox Thrash would anchor that um, with this position between Cecil B. Moore and Ridge Avenue um, with some really exciting businesses that can come in and kind of step in um, that have that legacy of film and art and printmaking already established. Most of these businesses are black and female owned. Um, and we're excited to kind of expand those possibilities of them um, in the development projects moving in. Um, and so our development partner, Beach Interplex, currently has a deal on the table with the current owner and our campaign uh, for the Black Futures campaign is in support of that and the purchase of the acquisition of that. And then also the, the robust um, and interesting development and into the community and the community design process um, and designing that with all of our, with me and my partners, we're hoping to go into the community and kind of talk to them and actually make this a real thing. Um, before it wasn't real, now it is. Um, so that, that's exciting. We're very, very excited about that. Um, we've done tours in the past and we talked about the possibilities, but now we can talk about concretely what this is gonna be and how it's gonna serve the neighborhood. Um, this is us at Community Futures Lab talking with people, collecting their stories, talking about the maps and, and the times there. Um, and it was a fun process for us and we're looking forward to doing that again. Um, and so over the four years, we've been doing a lot of work as far as like thinking about the house, thinking about what it takes to get it back in order, how much money it's gonna take. Um, and so with our experts, combined expertise, we've been looking at that um, and kind of coming up with the possibility of what this could be. Um, and so this is one uh, possibility based on the, the, the budget for the funding, but like saving the, the adjacent house and the lot. This is another possibility that we could think about is adding um, an addition to onto the building um, and having different spaces for different programming. And then a final possibility um, is connecting the two houses that are next to it with this building and having a lot of space for the arts in the, in the, in the community. Um, and then re reminding you again that this is a library. So this whole entire block would be a resource for the community, for the arts and the, and the, and the library and all those programs that are offered. Um, and then combined with everything else that's in the neighborhood, um, really be a, a goal and a gem for this community to have. Um, and then I think this development process, thinking of it from a neighborhood standpoint and a block standpoint, will contribute to the long-term st uh, stability and economic recovery of Starswood. So that's our approach um, to this process. Um, we've been working on it a long time. We're very, very excited um, to be here. I think we wanted to end this with this beautiful piece um, from Doc Strash, peaceful, lovely, great. Um, possibility. So thank you guys, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Maya. That is a facet. You have a fascinating project. It's amazing how much you all have put into it. So I'd like to introduce your partners now. Dana Rice has been practicing architecture with Cicada Architecture and Planning Incorporated since graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in 2016. Dana received her Master's of Architecture and Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from UPenn and a Bachelor of Arts in Architectural Studies from the University of Pittsburgh. Her professional work focuses on affordable housing as well as renovations and additions to existing buildings. She has been working with Chris and Maya on the Docs Thrash House Project since graduating lending her knowledge and experience with design and historic preservation. Christopher Mulford is a designer at Interface Studio Architects. As a designer, Chris combines interests within mixed used construction for both new and adaptive reuse building architecture. And I hope he can explain what that means exactly to those of us who aren't architects. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a master's degree in architecture, as well as a background in environmental design from the University of Colorado. So I'd like to invite all the panelists now onto um, the screen and we can have a discussion. We did have so far one question from the audience for Ron. 
Um, what is the relationship between Thrash's watercolors and drawings to his carborundum mesotints? Uh, well, I, I, I think the uh, that he, without the extraordinary ability he has for drawing, I don't know that he would have been so su successful making printmaking, uh, making the prints that he made. Um, I, I, I have to believe that when his training at the Art Institute of Chicago set him up with uh, the skills that he had um, and uh, it ends up that one informs the other. He, he as, as we showed with the portraits, um, they're, they're just very sensitive, beautiful uh, interpretations of, of people that he saw and knew. Um, and I think all are made very lovingly and, and knowingly. Hey, Ron, I, if, you know, if you don't mind me adding on to that, um, you know, through our research, um, you know, at the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art with uh, resources there, um, I actually did uh, hear that, you know, a lot of times before the carborundum print and etching would be made, the watercolors would be used, um, you know, like the same scene to figure out the light and the dark spot. Mm. Oh sure, um, um, yeah, yeah. There are you're right. There there are very specific studies, um, and in our exhibition, there are um, uh, he he would do kind of a, a linear outline of of the design for each print, um, and and the, the the drawings are all very heavily incised um, because he transferred them directly. He he would work out his design, if you will, on paper and then transfer it onto the plate. Well, um, we'll talk a little more about his art later. As I mentioned, we'll have a few slides. But um, I also would like the um, or the three of you on the Doc Stars House project to talk more about exactly where where this crowdfunding money will be applied and how how it will be used specifically in the project that you're planning. So right now. Um, Beach is still in the process of acquiring the property. So if all goes well with that, then we're hoping to spend 100% of this money on both kind of the redevelopment of the property. So, you know, stabilization, um, it's going to need significant um, structural repairs done to it, not just kind of rebuilding the stru structure. Um, and also, you know, fitting it out and making it like a habitable space because right now it's kind of not there yet. Um, um, and also we want to kind of do a pretty extensive community engagement process of like shredding and really figuring out what this project is going to look like at the end of the day and you know what what is it providing to the community you know how does it interpret the heritage of Doc's Thrash and also Shaka Muhammad who owned it after Doc's Thrash and he was a pretty important community figure as well and then um, yeah just kind of like what what does it want to be and how can we do that? And so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have a related question that's come in from the audience, uh, Maggie Block. Um, and my, she'd like Maya to discuss more about the ideas of what will happen once this is built out. Uh, how would it be a resource to the community? Will there be art classes? Will it be a community center? Um, what kind of activities will be going on in the building? Um, I think that's, yeah, that's an important question. Um, and so, so far in our community outreach, um, a lot of people have shown interest in that. Um, and so it depends heavily. Some of the ideas that have come out is to have like some kind of teen workshop where teenagers are learning how to print make and then also building businesses. So becoming printmakers. Um, some, some other ideas between our um, programming partners is basically uh, talking about film and doing film there um, for the community. So watching film, talking about film, making film is another possibility. Um, and I know that there's also a possibility to have like comic books be a thing <laughs> in this house. Um, and so making and learning about comic books and uh, maybe um, creating zines with teenagers. But definitely um, if there's enough space and room, I think there is enough space and room to have um, a part of this be a community center um, dedicated to the arts, but it's really, really dependent on finding an organization or starting a, a founding an organization that um, 
and has a capacity and does that well already. Um, and so I just want to say within, with during the campaign, we've had so many support, like about 90% of our support is from artists. So I don't think we'll have any problem um, <laughs> developing that. So yay, artists. Um, we're really, really excited about that. Yeah, you work for Mural Arts now, correct? Um, yeah. And I can imagine that that could be a big part of what you do too. I remember when I went to grad school in Philadelphia, the, the murals all around the city are so wonderful and right. um, yeah. And so uh, I was gonna say if I could add, when we were doing um, a lot of our earlier community engagement with um, Community Futures Lab, one thing that we heard also from the community was just a strong desire to make sure we are interpreting Thrash's heritage too. So I think whatever design we come up with, I think it will also be important that we are still kind of using it as a way to teach about Doc Thrash and like why he was important to the community and about his work and um, his process too. So. Uh, Ruth is asking, does the city of Philadelphia, um, has it lent any support to your project? Uh, so it is uh, listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places, so it actually is a protected building. Um, and LNI has been very good about enforcing that protection, especially whenever um, questions of possible demolition come up um, or redevelopment um, that would take away, you know, that would involve dem demoing the building. So, um, and, I guess, and um, yeah, I think that's. That's kind of the most support I yeah. guess we've well, I, and it, the there's a nonprofit organization that is lending you at least a promotional support, the the Preservation Alliance of um, Philadelphia, correct? Oh uh, yeah, the preservation yeah, they're not really they're not government, they're nonprofit. Right. Um, that's so, a um, nonprofit yeah. organization. Yes. Um, we've gotten um, support from a lot of different organizations in the city include from the Preservation Alliance and also the Association for Preservation Technology. So there's preservation and also arts focused groups within the city that have been pretty generous about um, yeah, supporting our campaign. Um, I know the Preservation Alliance specifically has, they actually submitted the nomination for the property and they've been helping out with the negotiations with the current owner for acquisition from Beach and also just any kind of um, kind of representation that is needed at any l &I hearings and things like that. So they've shown up and supported the house. So. so at this time, it would be hard for you to project a completion date for the project, I imagine. You're still in the initial stages of um, taking ownership of, right. the, of the site. Yeah, okay. one thing we've talked about though is kind of the need that once that is um, taken care of, really hitting the ground running with the project and, you know, starting, you know, just at least the baseline repairs that need done to it to make sure, you know, it doesn't, you know, the condition of it isn't degrading. And also, you know, for us really wanting to hit the ground running with the design process and getting, you know, community involvement in it, so. Okay. Um, and the three of you met at the University of Pennsylvania, correct? Uh, when you were in school together? Yes. Uh, why don't you tell us more about how this um, evolved as a cooperative project among the three of you? Um, I'll start. <laughs> it started with me. Um, so, <laughs> yes. Um, so Dana and I were a part of a, a studio, and in the studio, we usually get together and talk about uh, real life issues um, from a design um, aspect. So this was a preservation studio, um, and we were looking at that neighborhood of Charleswood, um, and we were looking at it particularly because of the PHA's plan to redevelop that neighborhood. Um, and all the hi historic res uh, resources that were in that neighborhood, we were researching that and kind of analyzing their plan. Um, and of course, Doc Thrash stood out immediately when we're looking at all the historic resources. And then also in contrast to that, for me, looking at Doc Thrash still standing and knowing everything else was gone, um, kind of highlighted the urgency for me to come in and kind of do something with that. 
Um, I was really, really inspired um, because of this work and school and then also coming from Los Angeles and seeing other neighborhoods that had been destroyed um, and, not, and not having the, the resources or wherewithal within that community to kind of say, hey, what should we do about this now? Uh, instead of waiting for someone else to come do something, um, I just really, really was inspired and wanted to do something. And so Dana was in that studio. Dana, um, I said, Dana, come. <laughs> I was like, we got to do this. You want to do it? Let's do it. And then she was like, yeah, I want to do it. And then um, we started from there. And then Dana, I'll let her go <laughs> from her perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, Mia and I were working on the studio together and we kind of learned about Doc's Thrash because it was obviously very important to the project we were doing, which was looking at the entire neighborhood. Um, and so we, um, and I was working on my architecture thesis and so was Chris. And so he kind of found out about it sort of vicariously. <laughs> yeah. Well, I stood next to you for like an entire year. It was, yeah. it was very interesting. Um, and that's kind of, uh, you know, one of like the, uh, the benefits of university study, um, you know, is kind of, you know, I'm, you know, architecture background, not historic preservation. Um, but, you know, given the opportunities and the closeness to kind of work with cross collaboration, you know, we really, you know, I learned a lot about the neighborhood and found the project very compelling. Um, I think as we all do, like the more you just kind of get into it, the more it kind of um, leads you along um, because it is so important. Um, we have a question uh, related to your work as well from Robert Brand. Maya shows showed opportunities involving two buildings immediate to the west and a new building just to the east. To what extent do you have to make a choice before work begins? Um, so the immediate buildings that are currently there are also in a condition that we need to address immediately um, and kind of make that decision um, as we move to uh, the community design process. Um, whether we stabilize them, demolish them, we don't want to demolish them, I'll just say that right there because they are also significant for a, the second occupant of this house. Um, the person Doc Sass sold this to, his name is Sheikh Mohammed. Um, he was part, he lived in the 1960s. Um, he was part of a kind of uprising that happened along Cecil B. Moore, Columbia Avenue at the time and um, Ridge Avenue where there was a police brutality incident in the 1960s um, and he was charged and arrested for inciting that riot. Um, he was a community activist. He owned most of those buildings that are on the corner from the left and the right. Um, and so he started a mosque there. Those two buildings are mosques, a library. Um, and so we do want to save those because it's an important part of the, the activism that's happening now and also Doc Stash's legacy. Um, so those two immediate buildings we would like to save. Um, and if we can save them, that that building that out and that square footage depends on um, the funding that's available. Um, building a new building next door in the vacant lot um, is a, a different situation. It's also based on funding, if we can do that, and then like size requirements and who's gonna be there, et cetera. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think and, we do know that, and maybe you were, I think you were gonna say it, Chris. Why don't you just say it, Chris? No, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure it's different. I'm sure mine's different. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say, we do know that in order to um, stabilize the um, our, to the Doc's Thrash House, we will need to make significant structural repairs to the existing adjacent buildings anyway. So it, on the one hand, it does make sense just to like go for those two. Um, I think whenever we were doing the initial kind of programming studies, we were kind of just sort of spitballing ideas to like see what would be most attractive to like a developer because one thing we kind of hit like while we were approaching various different development part potential development partners was a lot of times kind of like the house on its own didn't really make a whole lot of economic sense and so if we kind of showed them options with incorporating the adjacent properties then it kind of started to work better for them from a kind of a number standpoint um, so, you know, does it make, is it more economical, you know, to just buy a vacant lot and just build something new next to it? Or is, does it make more sense to buy the, the existing buildings next to it and just kind of put those out? So those were just kind of questions we were kind of 
looking at. Um, I guess for uh, Robert's question, yeah, yes, we need to figure and that then, out before we start construction. <laughs> well, and then I'll just add to the the time element of it. You know, one of the things we do have as a resource is you know, the fabric of Philadelphia and, you know, the inherent um, qualities of a row house, being able to, you know, um, share a property line and be able to do things over time that are differently. We know we can use this because of how we see the missing teeth, as they say, when you see empty lots um, down a block. Um, and so the, the natural, you know, city fabric of Philadelphia allows us some flexibility with this. So um, we have a question about your contribution. It sounds like you have a lot of, um, from Peggy Hartzell, um, you have a lot of expertise, Chris, in sort of the uh, issues you just mentioned. And could you explain to us a little more about your expertise as it relates to this project? Yeah, well, um, you know, I come, you know, from a building architecture background, um, you know, so one of the things, you know, that, you know, I work work with at my firm um, is uh, interface to architects is you know kind of like the complex relationships of the urban condition to like the individual building and you know it's you really can't design either one or think about either one in a vacuum um, they're you know kind of nuanced relationships um, to that and so I bring a little expertise you know of just dealing with you know diff varying different scenarios throughout the city and, you know, to help kind of understand what's going on locally. And then also, you know, um, you know, we, I make uh, drawings of, you know, little buildings, you know, so that we can understand what's going on. Nice drawings. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna, uh, we have another question. Do you uh, plan to establish yourself as a nonprofit? And if not, will you start to look for a fiscal agent so you can start getting government funding? So um, we're lucky enough to have our development partner be a nonprofit. Um, and so they're able to actually apply for all these loans and not loans, but grants and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they're also like a pillar in the community and really, really, really well connected with the city. So um, we're happy to have them on board. Um, and if we're hoping that the, the need for us to develop our own nonprofit is not going to be needed. And we're, we're just happy to kind of get this established and have it running and be um, a place um, for this community. And actually, I think my biggest driver is that um, at the top of my slides, it was like a case study um, because our approach and looking at this is something um, that's a little different for preservationists and architecture and development. Um, so if this project is successful, they can do it other places and it can be replicated. That's, that's my ultimate goal there. So your nonprofit developer is, was in the slides, but uh, could you just repeat that? Beach Enterprise. Yeah, Beach Enterprise. Beach Enterprise. Okay, uh, we have um, a question about the art and we'll circle back back to art as a topic. Um, so well, do you plan to design a mural as part of the project? It's certainly a possibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's, that, it's been there. It's in the talks. Yes, it's a way um, in my job. It's definitely we've lost two murals about Doc Slash in the city right now. Um, and so with this campaign and everything that's going on, it seems appropriate to um, to reintroduce that and have that be a part of the community process as well. Um, but I'm, I'm not making any promises, but I am advocating for it, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, I had a question for Ron about the um, exhibition he's organizing for the uh, with the African American Museum in Philadelphia that will be on view next year. Can you tell us more about the scope and the curatorial focus of this exhibition? Uh, of course, um, we're uh, well. My my sort of vision on it for it is is based on what we've done just previously, which is uh, kind of a loose survey of 
of works by Thrash. Um, the most recent group of shows that traveled um, put Carver on a in the title. Uh, and, and so um, that's always going to be central because that's really what he's famous for. Um, and uh, interesting, the question about the watercolors, uh, I, I think he's um, less known for uh, his paintings and watercolors. He didn't do a lot of, of painting. He did qu do quite a bit of wall, and he, he drew constantly. There, there are lots and lots of drawings, lots of little sketches. Um, and, and so uh, really, I, I, I think he was so much an observational artist that in a way he tells the story of his life and, and it's a, a, a really rich story. Um, and, and it can be told really through his work. So uh, when he works at the Sun Shipbuilding, there are all these paintings of ships all of a sudden. Uh, there's lots of pictures of neighborhoods. Uh, so it, it, it really is, um, it, it's really kind of autobiographical. And, and I think that's probably what will um, uh, continue to be the, the guiding principle uh, when we when we select works for the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, that show is going to be in 2021, and um, uh, uh, I, I I think that's pretty much where where it will uh, land on be, because there are all these uh, groups of works that that really tell his story, and and letting him use his own his own work to say who he is, I think is, is really the best um, approach. Well, thank you. Me of myself. Um, I hope to be able to see it. And uh, I remember it's a fairly large uh, museum. So uh, I imagine you have, it will be a fairly extensive exhibition. And I just wanted to point out some Sorry, did you have something to add, Ron? Uh, no, I, I saw there's a slide up from the art museum. I, I, the thing I would add is, is the, if you want to know a lot about Doc's Thrash, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art's book, you can sort of find it on Amazon. I don't think it's in print or available from the art museum, but um, John Itman uh, is the curator who authored this book and, and it's really a, a fabulous um, resource for anything regarding Doc's Thrash. Yes. It is out of print, um, and I think you might have it on your gallery uh, web page as well. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we probably have a copy for sale, that's true. <laughs> I, should, I should plug myself. <laughs> There's um, a little write-up here at, still on the Philadelphia Museum of Arts web page. Sarah, you're muted. a little background noise going on. Um, the, uh, this resource on the Philadelphia Museum of Art webpage is, is useful, but the book, of course, is more um, thorough. And then there is, a, um, if you could show the next slide, um, there's a downloadable educational resource that is complementary um, from the education department that really gives an overview of that exhibition that, that was on view at the time and gives a good sense of his career as an artist. Uh, next slide. Um, and then the, the Hyde Museum recently had an exhibition right before COVID hit and it's actually still online. You can check it out. The one, and this was organized by Dolan Maxwell, but the similar exhibition that's been traveling to the museums we mentioned earlier. Uh, and then uh, next slide, there's an uh, article about this Black Futures campaign uh, with WHYY online that you could explore to learn a little more about um, the project. And uh, next slide, the, there's a podcast as well, recently published uh, July 7th, um, with an interview with Maya and Chris for Pine Copper Lime. And I believe that the uh, producer and host is, is one of our guests today. Um, and we're um, happy to share that she uh, 
um, Miranda is the uh, host and she has organized a um, complimentary uh, promotion to those who donate to the project with Speedball. And uh, it's a giveaway for those who give more than $50 can be entered to win all of these wonderful printmaking supplies. And um, the way to do it is on the next slide. Um, the deadline is July 27th. And you just need to send in a screenshot of your donation uh, in a private message to the Docs Thrash Instagram account. And that's at Docs Thrash. So that's the Instagram account of our three panelists today from the project. I think I have that right, right? A private message? Yes. yes on Instagram. Is there any way for those who are not on Instagram to enter? Um, I think you can email it to us if you can't DM us. Um, our email is docsthrash.house at gmail.com. Okay. Um, I think we'll have to, we don't, since we disabled the chat, we can't yeah. type it in there. So it's docs, docs.thrash. Docsthrash.house. Docsthrash.house. Docs at Gmail. Okay. And uh, we have one more, a few more questions that came in from the audience. So uh, we can go back to that. Um, we have a couple more minutes here. Um, Peggy Hartzell asks, will you include John Mosley's photo of neighborhoods in the exhibit? That's for Ron. I'm sorry, say that again. Okay, will we? Uh, in the exhibition that's showing at the African American Museum, will you be showing uh, John Mosley's photos of the neighborhood? Uh, no plan to. I, I believe they were exhibited not very long ago in Philadelphia at the Woodmere Museum. Um, but that, that's, that would be up to the uh, African American Museum. Okay. And will there be a catalog? There is not a catalog plan at the moment. It would be wonderful if there was, but uh, okay. we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right. uh, you showed a beautiful carborundum mezzotint print with color called Devotion, um, a portrait of a young man. Was that, uh, was that a watercolor? That is a watercolor. Okay. And uh, it's one that was kind of recently discovered, and the exciting thing about it is that uh, in looking at, it might have been one of Mosley's photographs of the Pyramid Club. It was exhibited at the Pyramid Club in the 1940s, as was the watercolor City Plevins. Uh, we found that on one of the checklists from uh, the, the Pyramid Club. So um, it's always fun to link these historic things together. Um, I now you can hear me, I hope. Um, the, I think that's it for our questions tonight. We're coming up on six o'clock. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening and a special thanks to our panelists for sharing their time and knowledge with us. When you sign off this evening, uh, you will be directed to the Black Futures Campaign website, and we hope you will give generously to this outstanding project. And uh, be sure to send your screenshot in um, for a chance to win the Speedball giveaway. Manhattan Graphics Center will continue to deliver online programming until we can safely reopen to the public. Look for future events on our website, join our mailing list, or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Manhattan Graphic Center. So I'd like to just close by thanking Maya, Dana, Chris, and Ron, and much speed to your project. It's really um, fascinating, as Chris pointed out, the more you learn about it, the more um, you want to participate. And I hope it moves forward with success and a lot of support. Thank you guys so much for having us. Yes, thank you, everyone.